Hi, my name is Mikhail, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at the 8th Street Church, and I want to welcome you to worship together. Actually, I also want to congratulate you for making it here. Uh, the more people I talk to this week, the more I hear. It is <laughs> hard, and we are tired, and I am glad that you are here because I feel like you've come to the right place. I'm here because I need to hear and be reminded of what is true, and I think that's what you need as well. So let me remind us as we gather into this place, while you put your name in the chat for us to greet you, while you settle in, while you silence your phone, hear this truth. You are deeply loved. And in a world where it seemingly feels like truth is up for grabs, that truth is not. And this is a place where you are invited to receive and experience the fullness of that truth. So I invite you to join us in worship, in listening, in singing, receiving, and sharing this good gift of love that we receive together. Would you join us? Lord, I find you seeking Lord I find you in the doubt and to know you is to love you and to know so little else I need you oh how I need you
our souls, that you would be our joy and our delight, that we would find our hope and our meaning and our purpose in you alone, God, that you would draw us in to know you deeper and to rely on you above everything else. I ask all of this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Hi, everyone. Please excuse the laughter. I just recorded the whole thing in slow motion, so we're gonna do a take two. <laughs> my name is Alyssa. I am here in my home in the Asian district. And while we're not able to gather in the same space physically, we are gathering. Uh, the words will be on the screen, so I invite you to say your part out loud so we can all know we're saying them together. We gather here to tell the truth. We don't have our lives together. And on our own, we can't get them together. We confess that we are poor and we are hungry and thirsty for what we cannot provide ourselves. We need God's grace and we need each other. We gather here to tell the truth that while we are still sinners, God died in solidarity with us. And now you and I are forgiven, set free and adopted into a good family. You and I are not alone. We belong to God and to one another. We are God's people, people who are rich and satisfied, a people of peace, reconciliation, and love. Because Jesus has been the very best neighbor to us, we will be good neighbors to one another. So today we gather here to tell the truth. Our lives are better when we are neighbors. We will help one another in real ways and we'll have real conversations with one another. We are not all the same, but we are all ready for transformation. So let's do the very real and good work of God together. We gather here to tell the truth. We will be a spiritual community of hope and transformation that lives the way of Jesus. So right now, I want us to invite us to practice being good neighbors. We will continue to worship together online and we are becoming more aware of just how much we love and miss one another. So for the next three minutes, we wanna create a space for us to connect, to practice being good neighbors, even if it's virtual, just by checking in with at least one other person. As always, we want to remember to include our kids in this and you can send a message to a kid through his or her parents. If you don't have their parents' contact information, uh, send it to Pastor Hope. So with these things in mind, one, let's take a second to ask God to give us a name or two uh, to check in with right now. And all right, if a person comes to mind and you do not have contact information, uh, you can send it to one of our pastors and they will pass it on. So now for the next three minutes, uh, write a short message expressing that this person is on your mind. You might ask them how they're doing, what they're looking forward to in this coming week, and or how you can be praying for or supporting them right now. Uh, everyone ready to be good neighbors? Okay, let's go. chose the spot we dug the hole 
We laid the maples in the ground to have and hold as autumn falls to winter sleep. We pray that somehow in the spring the roots grow deep. After we are gone, these trees will spread their branches out and bless the dawn. Out and bless the dawn. So sit down and write that letter. Sign up and join the fight. Sink into all that matters. Step out into the light. Let go of all that's passing. Lift up the least of these. Lean into something. Lasting, planting trees. Mm. Yeah. She rises up as morning breaks. She moves among these rooms alone before we wake. And her heart. Welcome to the 8th Street Church. My name is Chris and I get to be one of the pastors here. I greet you in the strong and the powerful name of Jesus. Do you feel windblown yet? Uh, if the answer is yes, that's actually a good thing. The church was born on a windy day. There were 120 of them in the upper room praying when the Spirit descended on them. So whenever the Spirit is blowing, or whenever the wind is blowing, we know that the Spirit is blowing as well. One of the things that we do here at the H3 Church is we celebrate really, really good stories. We make sure to do that. Um, and uh, there's a surprising story that, that I want to tell, and then, and then uh, we'll have our storyteller come up. Uh, on J July the 25th, it was the hottest day of the whole summer, it felt like. And uh, our friend Emily lost her dog, Howie, on July the 25th. And a bunch of us went looking for the dog. We, we looked for hours, didn't we? How we went missing and how we was found on October the 25th. 25th, right? That's th that was the one day before the ice storm. A neighbor called. He was on the corner of Northwest 23rd and Villa. And the dog, Howie, has come back to life. And we are so grateful. I'm, I'm being serious about this. I prayed for Howie for months. And um, he is here in worship with us right over here. And so, one, look at him. He's looking around knowing that he's being uh, cheered for. One of the things that we do here at the 8th Street Church is we say that whenever we see good news, it is actually evidence of resurrection. And so... Um, our pets are parts of our family, and so we celebrate them. When there is brokenness, we grieve together. When there is celebration, we celebrate together. And that is one of the things that we do here at the 8th Street Church. 
Well, I want to invite my friend Barbie Moore, who is the Director of Global Outreach at Bethany First Church of the Nazarene, to come. She is going to celebrate, uh, she's going to tell us a story, and we are going to celebrate this story together. And so, uh, as you hear Barbie's story, I want you to celebrate the good news that you hear. Let's welcome Barbie Moore. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris, Pastor Mikhail, for asking me to come today and share just a couple of minutes with you. Um, I am working at BFC with Mission Partnerships, and in 2007, the partnership between BFC and Southern Nazarene University began with a country called Swaziland in Southern Africa, the country that still has the highest rate of HIV and TB in the world. Dr. David Busick, our senior pastor at that time, felt like we needed to put hands and feet to our prayers and come alongside Swaziland that was in great need. We also needed people to represent this partnership. And at that time, Dr. Brent and Reverend Mikhail Levine and Evan and Reverend Andrea Mosshart, a part of your own congregation, went as volunteers to spend a year there in Swaziland representing this partnership. I thank both couples for their great, great leadership. Amen. Well, it sounds like I'm here just to talk about Swaziland, but I'm actually here. Well, first of all, let me say that a year ago, the king of Swaziland changed the name to Eswatini. And you know, he can do that. When you're the king, you can change the name of your country. So, um, but I'm actually here to honor one of you, um, one of you um, in this congregation. It was early 2008 when Karen Dedman came to my office with an idea. She offered to organize a 5K, a Swazi 5K, to help raise funds to provide scholarships so people could join a team to go to Swaziland. I thought it was a great idea, but honestly, I thought, what would take so much time to organize a race, a 3.1 miles, a walk or run? But boy, was I ever wrong. It took a lot of effort. Scott and Karen both joined an early team from BFC and saw the great needs in Eswatini. Karen as a nurse, Scott as an architect, both had a great heart for this Southern African nation. Karen formed a wonderful committee of educators, community and church leaders, along with her very talented architect husband to join the Swazi 5K committee. Permissions were obtained in Bethany so we could walk in their streets. SNU hosted the start and finish lines. They raised sponsorship and they secured a very sought after title of being a USA track and field sanctioned event. That was a big deal. Everyone was welcome to participate from the serious runner to a young family with children. Scott was also a part of the fundraising and did all the artwork on t-shirts and race brochure. At every meeting, the Deadmans provided coffee, juice, and a plethora of pastries and quiche. Who wouldn't want to come and be a part of this very fun committee? Our beneficiaries expanded under Karen's leadership. We gave money to the Swazi Raleigh Ficken Memorial Hospital that delivered 9,000 babies annually. That was a real soft spot in Karen's heart as a former labor and delivery nurse. We gave funds to the HIV AIDS Task Force as a minister in over 700 homes across Swaziland with a family member ill with HIV, TB, or other opportunistic infections. Several years ago, Karen added the Bethany After School Program as a recipient for a local ministry. In the 11 years that Karen has been our leader, we raised a quarter of a million dollars for ministries in Eswatini and in Bethany. Let's celebrate that. That is so wonderful. I have one final comment. Lastly, Karen is passionate about great needs. She, she is so organized to help you achieve a great goal, and she greatly loves the Lord. What a winning combination. Can we thank this great lady once again? We love you, Karen Dedman.
So she's going to hate me, but we are going to invite Karen Deadman up to the front here. And Karen and Scott, if you would stand right here on my right. We wrote the Church of the Nazarene, the denomination. Come here, Karen, stand right here to my right because you're going to be on camera too. I know you're going to love this. We wrote the Church of the Nazarene, and they have decided because of the work that Karen has done to give her the Distinguished Service Award for raising over a quarter of a million dollars for HIV AIDS in Swaziland. And uh, the imagination that Karen, the reason that we tell this story is because we want to honor Karen, but we also want the imagination that she has to be carried out and to be carried forth into this congregation because you never know what you might do when you are obedient and you have imagination and you do it on behalf of your neighbor, even your neighbors that you do not know. And so would you celebrate one more time, maybe even by giving her a standing ovation, my great friend and the uh, recipient of the Distinguished Service Award, Karen Deadman. We're not allowed to hug you, but we would. <laughs> You want to give a speech, Karen? Okay. <laughs> Karen says she didn't want to give a speech. You can sit down. All Thank right. you so much, Karen. Watch your watch those cords. Well, at our church here at the 8th Street Church, we love celebrating good news. The good news of Howie coming home, the good news of our friend Karen, who raised over $250,000 and saved thousands of lives is something that we should celebrate. We celebrated it there uh, last Sunday, and uh, we invite you to celebrate it while you are worshiping with us online. My name is Chris. I get to be one of the pastors here at the 8th Street Church, and it is always a privilege for me to be in worship with you. One of the reasons that I'm here is because I am among, and I get to serve among, some of the most generous people around. Over the, the, the last five years that we've been together, I have watched this church give and give and give and then give some more. Uh, even in this place where I'm standing, the 8th Street Church building, uh, is it's here because of the generosity of generations before us, but it's also here because of the generosity of so many of you. Currently, we're in a building campaign where we're trying to raise the last $200,000 that we owe on this building, we want to pay this off so that we can continue to put our resources in our community to serve our neighbors better. And so we invite you to give. We invite you to give in a variety of different ways. You can give online. You can give by texting. You can go the old school way by writing a check and sending it to the church office. Uh, in, in any way you choose to give, it is an act of worship. And so we all do that together, and we do it first because God has been a good neighbor to us. Well, uh, we invite you also to give, if, if you're watching Church Online, we invite you to give by going to the chat box there and pushing the button and give, and we invite you, if you're watching on YouTube, to, uh, to go to the notes, and it'll, you'll find a link to go to our website. But regardless how you give, I just wanted to say thank you for giving. Uh, one thing that I want you to know here at the church that's happening is we are going virtual in a lot of ways. As these COVID numbers continue to go up, we, we try to think through what it means to be good neighbors, but we did not start this church to create space between us. We actually started this church so that, that space could be closed between us, and that has been extra difficult in this time. But we believe that God is a God of space and matter and time, and God even connects us in the space where we can't be with one another. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to have an opportunity to do some praying together. On Thursday nights from 7 to 8, you can, uh, you can join a Zoom meeting. Uh, that link to the Zoom meeting will be in your e-note. If you're not part of our regular e-newsletter, our e-note, we invite you to go to our website, 8streetchurch.org and sign up to be a part. You'll learn of all of the things that are happening in our community when you sign up for our e-note. As we continue in this time of worship, uh, today, here where I am, it, it is Wednesday, but it is Wednesday, November the 11th. November the 11th is Veterans Day. And in this time of turmoil and political chaos, 
we don't want to forget that there are those who understand and have committed themselves by giving the gift of freedom. And so we recognize those in our community, those who are around our church, who understand sacrifice better than some of the rest of us do. But even while we recognize them and we thank them for their service, we also want to acknowledge that true freedom doesn't come in the fact that I can do whatever I want whenever I want. True freedom actually comes in the capacity that God gives us to love one another. At the heart of the word freedom, if you would trace it back to its very original intent, it is closely connected to the word friend. When we are free, we give our lives to our friends. That is what we are about here at the 8th Street Church. And so, uh, with this in mind, we want to pray together. We want to recognize that the first friend that we ever had, even before we knew him, was this God who sent his son on our behalf. And so, let us, let us pray together. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, you are relationship, one that is equal with the other. And for that, uh, you reflect what it means to be love and relationship for us. And so, we want to be the kind of people that experience your kind of freedom. Freedom that uh, traces its way back all the way to its origins, which is connected to the idea of being friends with one another. We long to be together. Most of us are so tired of electronic church. We long to be with neighbors and loved ones, and we long to be uh, with brothers and sisters. We long to be with uh, family and relatives, even as we are coming into the holiday season. And yet we are seeing these numbers go up, these COVID numbers go up, and it brings fear and we, uh, we worry that we're going to have to shelter in place once again. We're grateful for the great news that we heard this week, that uh, there are those who are creating a vaccination. We're grateful for the ability that you give us to have uh, protective measures even now, masks, being able to wash our hands being able to talk with people outside and stay six feet away, even that, even those are gifts to us because when we do that, we are saving our friends' lives and when they do that, they are saving our lives. And yet at the same time, we pray for doctors, medical professionals, we pray for frontline workers, we pray for those who are serving in a variety of different capacities. As of now, during this recording, we know that our hospitals are full we know that our doctors, our nurses, and our practitioners, our medical service engineers, and others are working their fingers to the bone. We know that they and their families are worried, just as worried as when we heard of this disease in March, and we pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would continue to find ways to uh, use those who are trying to distribute, not just make, but distribute a vaccination so that not just those who have health care and those who have resources to purchase vaccinations might be able to get them, but even the poorest of the poor might be able to get these and have the ability and the access to these, uh, these gifts that you have given us, but yet uh, are hard to distribute. We pray that you would cut ways to make it easy to distribute so that our friends who are in these areas might have health and wellness and so we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. We pray for peace, peace wherever we see it, peace wherever we go. From the top to the bottom, this place, this planet, this country, even this state and this city seems to be in longing for peace. From passing, pe passing power peacefully from one another to the peace that we want to extend over the fence with our neighbor. This is what we hope for. We pray that the God who has come and is coming and who will come again will be the one that is present in us. The one that we anticipate, the one that we are thankful for in this holiday season, we ask that, that this one would bring peace to us. Peace to our world. We're grateful for all that you have done for us and we give you the praise wherever we go and in whatever we do. And it is in your strong and mighty name that we pray these things. Amen and amen. Well, we're in a wonderful sermon series called Saints. 
And uh, last week we had a, a wonderful preacher, Leah Ben, who brought the word to us to, uh, last week. And tonight, today, we have another wonderful preacher. Hope Kaimig is our children's pastor and is an excellent preacher. And she is going to be telling the story of a saint. And so I invite you to lean in and to lean in deep. We listen to the stories of saints because they are the ones who model for us how we live as faithful followers of Jesus in the world. And so lean in and listen to the good news that will be presented to you today. Hi, I'm Hope, and I get to be one of the pastors here at the 8th Street Church. And I'm here because I need God's grace, and I need you. I'm here because I've been forgiven, set free, and adopted into a really good global family that spans centuries. As Pastor Chris said, we are in the middle of a series on the saints. Each year we do this as a way to reflect on the lives of the faithful ones who have gone before us. It's honestly one of my favorite things that we do each year. It's a moment of reflection and encouragement and just a time to be grateful. But here we are. We are nearing the end of 2020. We are in the midst of a global pandemic that has taken the lives of over a million people and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. We are exhausted in just about every way possible. I think it's particularly important this year to look at the lives of the saints because when we take a step back from our current context with all of its political upheaval and fear and anxiety and all of it, we get to look at those who have gone before us and it reminds us of the bigger story. It reminds us that we, the 8th Street Church, situated on the corner of 8th and Lee in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, we are but a small part of the kingdom and the story of God. This story is much bigger and longer than we can imagine. When we take a step back, it does not lessen our grief or fear or lament, but it does place it in its correct context. We are in the midst of a long line of people who have found the way of Jesus worth following, even in the midst of plague, famine, war, and persecution. We get to walk in their footsteps. We get to follow the path that they have helped carve out. As I reflected on whose story I wanted to tell you today, I was a bit conflicted. I thought through my own personal heroes, Fred Rogers, Brian Stevenson, Father Gregory Boyle, These men, they have led extraordinary lives of faithfulness. They have embodied neighborliness. Fred Rogers, as you might know, he taught us to treat children with dignity and kindness through an underfunded television program. Brian Stevenson, he is a lawyer who defends prisoners on death row while treating them with empathy and compassion. And Father Greg, he provides meaningful work and reconciliation to gang members in Los Angeles. There are books, documentaries, even a few film adaptations of these men's lives. When I read their stories, I am in awe of the way God has used them. But sometimes that awe, it can leave me feeling a bit stuck. Some of us, in the midst of our never-ending schedules, we can even struggle to find time to read these stories or watch these films. The hours in our day, they are filled with the mundane, the ordinary. So in light of that, the scripture that I chose for today is Matthew 13, 33. In this chapter, Jesus is in the midst of teaching about the kingdom of God. He says God's kingdom is like yeast that a woman works into the dough for dozens of loaves of barley bread and waits while the dough rises. One of the things I love about Jesus is that when he taught, he didn't often use long theological expositions. I personally love big, lofty theological doctrines that I can take apart bit by bit to understand. But Jesus didn't offer that. Instead, Jesus, he told stories. And he told stories about really ordinary, everyday objects, like a woman making bread in her kitchen. And these things, they illustrate the truth of the kingdom of God. The way of Jesus is revolutionary. But it is told primarily through ordinary terms. Bread, water, gardens, Jesus says the stuff that makes up our everyday, it's actually the place where the revolutionary work of the kingdom begins. So, today, I want to tell you the story of St. Susanna Wesley. You can see a picture of her right here. Her very life embodied the sacred ordinariness of the kingdom of heaven. You may know her as the mother of John and Charles Wesley. 
John was the founder of Methodism and the father of the Holiness Wesleyan tradition. As Nazarenes, we look back to him as one of our core founders and teachers. Charles Wesley was also a distinguished theologian and songwriter. You may know some of his hymns, Christ the Lord is risen today, come thou long expected Jesus, hark the herald angels sing. These men, they were incredible thinkers and practitioners of the word. When you look at their stories, the influence of their mother, it is undoubtable. She was the driving force of their education and spiritual formation. Susanna was born in 1669 to Samuel and Mary Annesley. She was the youngest of 25 children. Her father, he left the Church of England and he founded a group of nonconformists. Susanna was well educated and it's safe to say that her father taught her how to use her bright mind. Early on, she learned to listen to the call of God on her life. After intense reading, prayer, and discussion, Susanna left her father's group to rejoin the Church of England at just 12 years old. This decision was not the result of teenage angst, but rather methodical, deliberate discernment. This was who Susanna always was. When she felt God's call to obedience, no one could dissuade her. She would commit herself to a path and carry it forward, no matter the consequences. In the Church of England, Susanna met Samuel Wesley. The two were married in 1688. Like Susanna's father, Samuel was also involved in ministry in the church. Samuel held many different positions throughout his life, including chaplain in the Navy and rector in different villages in England. There's actually quite a bit of information regarding this marriage because Susanna, she kept up with journals and she wrote a lot of letters. And because of this uh, well documentation, we can tell you that their marriage was not always the smoothest sailing. <laughs> As you can tell, Susanna, she had a strong mind and a conscience of steel. While she loved her husband and did her best to respect and honor him in all areas, there were issues that she was not going to budge on. In fact, their most infamous fight came about because of a disagreement upon politics. wonder if that sounds familiar to anybody. Uh, one night, Samuel blessed the king during his evening prayers. Susanna quietly just didn't echo it. She didn't say amen. Well, Susanna, Susanna and Samuel, they had differing ideas about who the rightful king was. This small, quiet act of defiance, it led to a year and a half long fight. Susanna refused to conform to Samuel's political ideas. Samuel said that until she did, they would sleep in separate beds. Neither budged. The only reason it ended was because England got an entirely new king who they could agree on. Despite their somewhat spicy relationship, the two had 19 children together. Sadly, only nine survived infancy. Susanna was an incredibly deeply committed mother. She prioritized her children's education and spiritual development in surprisingly egalitarian ways. Each child, boy and girl, was held to incredibly high standards. And she even made time to meet with each child individually one evening a week. Once, when Samuel was away for a while at a conference of the Church of England, he was gaining power and influencing church law. Well, Susanna, she became concerned for the spiritual well-being of her children. She did not particularly like the rector who was taking Samuel's place at the time, so she began to host nightly devotionals with her children. She would read scripture, pray, and sometimes preach one of her husband's sermons. They would take time to discuss different devotional topics, this doesn't seem controversial at all, does it? Well, somehow word got out, and people began to show up to these prayer meetings. Week by, or day by day, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger. At one point, there were over 300 people at the Wesley House for evening devotions. This was way more than who showed up for morning service with the substitute rector. The rector was scandalized and angry. He wrote to Samuel in London complaining about Susanna's behavior, and he insisted that he tell his wife to cut it out. Susanna refused. He continued to insist, and she replied, here, I have the quote for you. If you do, after all, think it fit to dissolve this assembly, do not tell me anymore you desire me to do it. Well, that will not satisfy my conscience. But send me your positive command in such full and express terms as may absolve me from all guilt and punishment for neglecting this opportunity of doing good to souls when you and I shall appear before the great and awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, come on. Basically, she told him he can take his grievances up with God because she was not about to stop. 
She would not turn away from caring for those in her community just because her pastor and her husband thought it looked improper. We don't know if her son John had any understanding of the controversy surrounding these evening prayer services, but we do know he was present for them. He also received direct spiritual guidance from his mother well into adulthood. These meetings and this guidance, it no doubt influenced his own methodology. He would go on to hold his own meetings and societies that would also rival traditional church attendance. There is no doubt that his mother's influence during this time would greatly shape him. He would go on to call her a preacher of righteousness. You may not know this, but the Wesleyan tradition, it has always held space for women in all aspects of ministry. Is there any doubt that this is at least partly because John watched his mother fulfill God's calling on her life regardless of convention? Up until the moment of her death, Susanna was pursuing obedience to God in every aspect of her life. She invested in the education and spiritual formation of her children and her community. She wrote sustained theological essays, expositions on the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the importance of education. Many of these were destroyed in a house fire, so she spent the later years of her life rewriting and expanding these in order to be faithful with the mind and education that God had gifted her. Listen, nothing about Susanna's day-to-day life looked impressive or extraordinary. Her family struggled financially all the time. The Wesleys lived through two different house fires. When Susanna was expecting, as we know she had 19 children, she's often extremely sick. She did not hold much influence in her country or her world. She was not sought after for TED Talks. She didn't have counsel with the queen. None of her writings were published until after her death. Most of her days were spent within her home caring for those who found themselves there. So why do I think it's important to tell you about her? What makes Susanna Wesley's life an example for us all is the way she lived her life in faithfulness, not just in a few impressive acts of faith, but rather every day, moment by moment, she offered what she had to God. Each day, she prayed with her children. She read scripture to them. She disciplined and redirected. She held firm to preach the word of God to people hungry for direction, even as she was shamed and reprimanded for doing so. On their own, these actions, they look to be small, insignificant even. But when you zoom out and you look at the culmination of all of these actions together, it is astounding. This daily faithfulness, this daily methodology that was built in her children, it became a strong foundation. It influenced her children's lives who had much more public lives of faithfulness. As Nazarenes, we look back particularly to John Wesley consistently for his practical theology and his vision of the church. We only have to look a little bit further back to find where he got those roots. I think one of the clearest pictures we have of ordinary work crashing into and mixing with the revolutionary life-changing stuff is motherhood. The love and care of a mother whether biological or not, is anything but ordinary. You know this whether you've had a good mother or not. You feel the weight of its presence and its absence. For those who have physically carried a child, you know what it means to have your body broken for the sake of another. You have used your very body as a means of nourishment. Others have provided nourishment through a listening ear over a homemade meal. Creating and maintaining house rules, direction, redirection, unrelenting forgiveness and prayer, that is the stuff of motherhood and the kingdom of God. Empathy and compassion that lead to fierce advocacy. Susanna, she did not host evening prayer meetings because she was bored and didn't have anything to do. She saw a very real need in her community and opened herself up for God to use her to fill that need. The work of motherhood is often overlooked and undervalued. And I want you to hear me. I'm not just speaking to those who have had children living under their roof. I'm speaking to you, counselors, teachers, Sunday school volunteers, leaders of nonprofit, lawyers. You are doing the work of mothering. You're teaching, you're caring, you're leading, you're advocating. Sometimes the work, it feels mountainous. And the daily acts of obedience feel minuscule compared to the amount of grief and fear and hopelessness that is present. 
But the kingdom of God is not like the consumerism of the world. You do not get out what you put in. The work that you are committed to is not yours alone. God is partnering with you. In this kingdom reality, our love is invested and multiplied. Over time, it grows like the yeast into something nourishing and sustaining. It is not immediate. It is not a quick fix. And it is often nothing like we picture. In fact, we may never know the full extent of the fruits of our faithfulness. Susanna surely didn't. There's no way she could have dreamed that the legacy of her evening prayers with her kids would grow into a denomination that spans the globe. In the words of the poet Lin-Manuel Miranda, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. So when Fred Rogers accepted his Lifetime Achievement Award, he took a moment and asked the audience to think of someone special, someone who had brought them to where they were that day. I'm going to pull Mr. Rogers here. And I'm going to ask you to think of someone in your life who has mothered you well. Maybe it's your biological mom, maybe not. Maybe it's a counselor, sister, pastor, aunt. I don't know who it is. But take a moment right now and think about who that might be for you. What did they offer you that was so life-changing? Was it one big moment? Or rather, a culmination of consistent presence? Can I tell you who I think of? I have been really lucky to have a lot of good mothers present in my life. My biological mom was an incredible mother. She's an incredible woman, and she reminds me a bit of Susanna. She passed away when I was really young, but the fruits of her love and faithfulness, they're present in my life to this very day. I was gifted with an incredible stepmom who loved and cared for me and guided me and even reminds me to take a nap almost every week. <laughs> but when I think about the last few years of my life, the challenges, the joys, I think about who has mothered me really well. I think about you, 8th Street Church. You have been a mothering presence in my life. When Dan and I first came to what was then Midtown Church, we were a bit skeptical because of our prior church experience. But we had a deep belief in what the church could be and a commitment to participate in that vision. We had no idea what we were walking into. Neither of us grew up Nazarene, and we didn't even really know what a Nazarene was. Neither of us had been to a church that ordained women. We definitely didn't know how to belong to a community that actually talked to one another during the service. When we'd been attending for just a few months, um, I was expecting my second baby. Holly Pollock came up to me and asked, when is a good date for us to throw your baby shower? I was a little surprised and a little nervous, to be honest. I only knew like seven of you, and I could only remember about five names. <laughs> but you wanted to throw me a party and to celebrate our daughter. I remember sitting at home the night of the baby shower, surrounded by diapers and books and onesies and cards full of names I didn't recognize. And I was overwhelmed. If this community can celebrate someone they barely know, what would happen if we really invested? I have to be honest, being loved that well felt a little scary after years of being held at arm's length. It's been four years since then, and I can tell you your mothering love for us, it's only increased. Every note, text, email, or call of encouragement, it has not gone unnoticed. You have sent flowers during moments of grief, shown up at the hospital in moments of fear, dropped off meals, cleaned my house, and helped me put my kids to bed during a season of postpartum depression. Your love has carried my family in very real ways. You have prayed for us, nurtured us, encouraged us. You have lived up to your word. You have been really good neighbors and a really good family. Your investment of love and care into the lives of me, Dan, and in particular my kids, it means so much. 
I know you would not have been able to offer that love if you had not been loved that way yourself. Praise be to the God who nurtures us, guides us, advocates for us. I pray that you would experience the nourishing and sustaining love of this mothering God this week. Amen. Thanks be to God and thanks to Hope for being a good mother for us as well. Each week we are invited to take on a practice that enables us to live the way of Jesus throughout the work, the week with the words that we have heard. And so this week, whether you yourself are a mother or not, we invite you into a small act of mothering, which is preparing and sharing a meal. Maybe that's with um, a neighbor, maybe that's with a family member, maybe that's going out of your way to do extra work in your household that you don't normally do. But however you prepare and share a meal, we invite you to take this on as a way of remembering and inviting that presence of God in the small acts of faithfulness and obedience that we do throughout the day. You'll find an invitation into this practice in your inbox on Monday, or you can find it on social media later this week as well. Before we sing and receive our final song of benediction together, I want to invite you to receive these words of blessing before we go. Friends, may you know deeply and may you remember well the love of your good God the love of the very best mother. May you take this love in and may it change absolutely everything about you. Amen. Your labor is not in vain Though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained the planting and reaping are never the same your labor is not in vain the vineyards you plant will bear fruit the fields will sing out and rejoice with the truth for all that is old will at last be made new. The vineyards you plant will bear fruit. Thank you.